everybody give a big round of applause for the Sea of Chag, my friend Dan Rosenzweig. Thank you so much. So I think everyone here knows what Chag is, but just let's round it out, you know, talk about Chag, and then we're going to go into your background and what brought you up to that business a couple years ago. So I've been at Chag for seven years, and let me tell you what I'm not, and it relates to what I am at Chegg. So many of you have my eternal envy because you're founders. I am not a founder. In fact, a lot of my friends came here tonight, which I'm so grateful for, and they are founders or people who invest in founders. Um, they're founders, they're entrepreneurs, they're executives. I spent the first 40 years of my life as an executive, finally hit rock bottom and became an entrepreneur at 40 when I moved to Silicon Valley. And now I am what I like to refer to as a refounder, which is I've taken over, took over a company that had an idea, had momentum, but didn't necessarily have a future, um, which was Chegg, which we invented the textbook rental model. But it turned out that instead of six months away from an IPO, we were 90 days away from going broke. So I certainly learned what it was like. So I had to raise $100 million in the first 100 days of the company just to keep it from going out of business. Then I had to figure out what to do with it. So the last three years as a public company, um, you know, we had one of those great IPOs, which is, you know, you get to stand up there and watch your stock soar. You think you're rich for a minute. I didn't get that moment. We priced at $12.50, first trade $11.25, day closed at $9.68. We've not seen that number since. So uh, take none of my advice. Uh, but what we've done is we've transformed the company from becoming a, a company that was a textbook rental company, rent return, rent return, where we used $120 million a year to buy books, arbitrage them, had to figure out, built a warehouse, shipping, all of those things that you needed to do, customer service, to at the end of last year, we became a 100% pure digital company where the new businesses are growing in excess of 40% a year. So we went from losing 18 million in EBITDA to last year making 21 million in EBITDA to this year, if analyst expectations are right, making uh, 35 million in EBITDA and going from a company that um, used 120 million in cash to a company that now produces over $20 million a year in free cash flow. And that's all taken place in three years as a public company. So let's talk so. about the Czech story for a second. Thank you. <laughs> I think a lot of us here in this room, uh, despite the challenges that you said coming into it, would love to have that story of starting a company and then taking it through an IPO. Just walk us through, uh, you know, when Chegg got started, how much money it raised before it IPO'd, you know, the size of the team today, uh, just to, for people to get a sense of really how long that journey was. Well, Chegg's probably 10 years old, and, it, and it's a great, I, I suppose this is a political statement, but it's not meant to be. It's just a statement of fact, which is Chegg's one of those companies that can only be founded in America. So we had um, uh, Indian Hindu move and go to business school in America, first time in America, went to Iowa State, because the only people you can get to go to Iowa are people that have never been to America. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he then graduated Iowa State, but he had started this thing called Chegg Post, which was a way to buy and sell stuff on campus, because the name Chegg came from, geez, college is really expensive, yeah. and in order to afford college, I need to get a job. But in order to get a job, I need to go to college, so which came By from the way, to me, the most impressive thing about Chegg is I think literally every single person that has gone to college at some point wanted to start the business of reselling textbooks. textbooks yeah. every, every single person has that idea, and, and those folks are the ones that were successful. Well, he, was very, he is very smart. I've invested in his next company called Nectar, which I love him to death, and we're very close. And he came to Silicon Valley and met his cousin-in-law for the first time, who was a Pakistani Muslim. So what is it that an Indian Hindu and a Pakistani Muslim do when they want to run the company? They hire a New York Jew. <laughs> so. That's the only in America story. But so the company's probably 10 years old. My tenure there, February, was my seventh year. When we started, the company had just raised what they thought was the last round, which was, was a Series D, uh, which was $56 million. And honest to goodness, I was told we were six months away from going public. All I needed to do is get the company public, stay there two years, and I'd make a certain amount of money. And that sounded great to me. Um, and let me jump in and for that, a moment. None of that happened. <laughs> 
because we're gonna, I wanna keep talking about that, but I don't know if everyone here knows how impressive your background is. So just really quickly, you know, those last three jobs that you had pre-Chegg. Well, the one that taught me everything was actually that I spent 15 years in magazine publishing. So you're, many of you are way too young to remember these things called magazines. Uh, but computer magazines were the first magazines to go online, and so I took a company, Ziff Davis, who did PC Magazine, PC Week, Computer Shopper, and created an internet division called ZDNet, and then spun it out separately and took it public and sold it to CNET. When I, when I finished with CNET, I, on my board as Ziff Davis, we had Masayoshi son of SoftBank, and also um, my boss, Eric Ippo, convinced Masa to invest in this cool new company called Yahoo, so I ended up getting Jerry Yang on my board, and we all just got to know each other. When we started, magazines were bigger than Yahoo, and when we finished, Jerry Yang you know, is a member of Augusta with $14 billion, and I'm renting textbooks. <laughs> so I think that's the story of the internet. But um, after that, I went to Yahoo as the chief operating officer in 2002. Uh, so yes, everything that's going on now is extraordinarily disappointing. I retired at the end of 2006. Um, we took the company from 700 million to four and a half billion, from no profits to a billion and a half, and somewhere around 40 billion dollars in market cap. Was part of the team that did the Alibaba deal, but we really transformed the company. But obviously, the rain clouds were on the horizon with Google going through the roof, the creation of Facebook, all those things. So when I retired from Yahoo, I spent a year doing uh, nonprofit because I didn't have a clue, you know what I want to do. Then I went into private equity. Again, don't follow my timing either. I went into private equity. The day I started in private equity, Lehman went under. <laughs> and I knew so much about private equity, I didn't know what Lehman was or what going under meant until nine months later, I quit and went to Guitar Hero. So I, I worked down here for a while at Activision, became CEO of Guitar Hero, and then uh, Chegg came calling after that. So I've had a varied career, but everything I've done has been offline to online. If is there, one of the things I want to spend some time talking with you about, because I think uh, you're in this rare position where I think you've had this incredibly successful career, you've had these multiple lives in your professional career, and I think you're an outstanding judge of character and of people. Is there anything you would have done differently on your journey? I bet a lot of the folks here are wondering and questioning what path they should be on and whether they should stay as entrepreneurs or whether they should try to become an entrepreneur, what would, if you, as you look back over the career you've had, is there anything you would have done differently if you had to do it all over again? Well, you know, it's one of those hypothetical questions, and the answer is, if I ended up in a different place than I am now, no, because I really like the life I have. I have extraordinary friends. I've been married to the same amazing woman for 29 years. I have two daughters, 24 and almost 22, and one just got promoted and moved to London to work at BuzzFeed, and the other is going to work at Rent the Runway. So they're following in the internet, consumer internet tradition of the family. And, I, and so I have amazing friends, a bunch of them are here tonight, that I wouldn't change for the world. What I would change about myself, though, is, and my, and my daughter really explains this to me uh, more than anybody. And, and when I was switching from guitar here to Chegg, she said, Dad, all you've ever said is, if you're going to make a bet on somebody, bet on yourself. And so most of my career, although really good looking on paper, still allowed me to bet on somebody else. So it, it, was, it was an opera. Even when I took ZDNet public, it was a tracking stock. SoftBank owned 84% of Ziff Davis, which owned 84% of ZDNet, which meant Masa owned everything, including my children. So you know, <laughs> it, I had a sporty title, but at the end of the day, I really had not had the opportunity to go out there and see what I can build. Um, and I called a bunch of friends because my ego was going to get in the way. That's the other thing is you all need powerful egos to do what you do. Um, I have a very interesting view of founders since I've worked around them my entire career. Founders are never wrong. They, were, they never made a mistake. And the only thing that happened is their idea was too early or investors were too stupid to realize that they <laughs> needed to put more money in. Um, and, and good for them, because the world needs them, and that's why the world changes. So what I wish I had understood earlier was where do I play on that food chain? If I'm not going to be a founder and being an executive was limiting, 
I would have understood what it meant to be an entrepreneur and take the reins on my own faster. I didn't really do it until I was 40. I had great jobs. I was making great money. I, you know, all that kind of good. I knew every cool person you could know. But at the end of the day, I went home every night recognizing that someone else was the final decision maker. And I, I, I wish I had appreciated that earlier. And most of you clearly have. So I want to stay on this topic of people a little bit longer because I think you're this rare resource that we don't often get. What are, this, what are some of the mistakes that you see people on the earlier side? I, I don't mean entry level, but you, know, you, you see the folks here and, and you know, kind of where everybody's at. What are the mistakes that you see people make early on in their career? And whether they're trying to start something or whether they're trying to build up a career like you had. Well, see, I didn't have the confidence that any of these people have. So I, I, I don't want them to lose that. But what I would say is nobody does this on their own. Your team is as if not more important than you are. Don't micromanage really great people because they're really great people. Then you don't have to micromanage them. How did you, know, you, you get your early shot? You had this, it sounds like, was the, how old were you when you were joining ZDNet and, and taking that publishing business public? Well, I, jo I joined Ziff Davis. So here's the other piece of it. I, I don't give advice, so I give wisdom. And wisdom is, the, is just literally the accumulation of being old, which I'm older than almost everybody here, um, fucking up more often than you have, which I'm certain that I have, and then being alive and willing to talk about it. So um, life is not a straight line. It just isn't. You can plan all you want. It's not a straight line. So my first job, first I thought I was going to go to law school. I graduated Hobart William Smith. I thought I was going to law school. Stepfather showed up at graduation and said, mm, Mom and I are not getting along that well. Here's something called debt. You own it. And I'm like, OK, let's drink through the LSATs instead of go take them. <laughs> and so I did that. Um, so I wasn't going to be a lawyer. Now I needed to find a job. And so the only skill that I had. Let's imagined, just put a timeline on this. What year is this? 1983. Computers had just been started, right? The big famous Mac commercial hadn't run yet. Um, yeah, I'm old. I told you I was old. You don't need to rub it in. So instead, I was like, all right, so we're going to have to sell the house because my mom's second marriage, so you don't get to keep it and got to figure out where to live. So I got to earn a job that pays me the most. So I went and got a job instead of the one that I wanted for 15 grand, I took the one for 18 grand. And it was a company called Pitney Bowes Dictaphone. And they were in this really cool business of selling word processing. And so I was going to go literally door to door at every New York City building in my territory and try to convince the receptionist to let me talk to somebody about selling them this thing called word processing. Remember, there was no Microsoft yet with, with any of that stuff. They hadn't even invented that stuff. You were door to door software selling well, a word a, processor? Well, it was hardware at the time. And so but wait, I, to businesses or consumers? To businesses. Okay. You can't sell door to door to a consumer. Well, that's what's trying to, yeah. Yeah, that's a little creepy. <laughs> um, so I get there on the first day and they say, Dan, you scored higher on the test than anybody. We're so excited. You get the, literally, they said, you get the chair that overlooks the women's gym across the street because you scored higher on the test than anybody. I'm like, it's going to be the best job ever. So they said, we're going to have a meeting in two hours. Just eat some bagels, meet everybody. So I go up, we go up to this big meeting upstairs. This is really cool new technology called video conferencing. Um, and the CEO of Pitney Bowes Dictaphone gets on and said, announcing today, Pitney Bowes Dictaphone is no longer in the word processing business. 999 people are being laid off. Guess who is 999? So I called back the original place and said, do you still have a, a job for me? And they're like, Dan, they loved you. They want you to come in. So I thought I was going to be selling, by the way, Best thing in the world, got a week's severance. Got a, no, got a month's, one week pay and a month's severance. So I was making 1100 bucks an hour. <laughs> so I figured this is easy money. Just keep getting fired on your first day. He's <laughs> rolling up the dough. So uh, I start in two weeks because naturally I was really stressed over this. So I needed a two-week break between my first two hours on the job, <laughs> the next job. And I go in as if Davis and I thought, okay, I got this really cool job, which is Magazines were hot back then. It was Road and Track, Car and Driver, Stereo Review, Psychology Today. I mean, the Ziff family had invented special interest publishing, the greatest publisher in the world, Bill Ziff. And just to be clear, you, you did not grow up wealthy or with any unique no. or special advantages. Well, I'm extraordinarily good looking, but beyond that, <laughs> um, no. I mean, 
I, I grew up sort of better half of middle class. Um, but no, there was, you know, my grandfathers were immigrants, auto parts sales, small time jeweler. Nobody either finished high school or went to college. So that was not unusual for immigrant families. Or, and, but I always knew I was going to college. I got a four year degree. I ended up moving to Scarsdale when I was 10, which is about as good as you can get. So I had the benefit of the best at public education in the country and a whole network of people that were really awesome. And many of them, you know, like I graduated high school with Aaron Sorkin, which is, I know I'm not even the coolest kid in my class. <laughs> so um, thought I was going to get this job selling classified advertising, which was a pretty good gig, you know, at 22 years old. And it turned out I walked in the building and I, they said, Dan, you're, they're no longer on this floor, they're on this floor. So I walked over to this floor. Every single person that had interviewed me was moved from that division to a brand new division called the Computer Magazine Division, because mm -hmm. they literally, in that two weeks, bought a computer magazine, and we're gonna go into the computer industry. So, no straight lines. I literally never sold classified advertising and went into circulation for computer magazines. <laughs> I hated computers. It's the, I got a C in the one computer class I took, and my first job there was telemarketing, convincing mom and pop computer stores to carry a computer magazine for resale. So, if I have a lesson, it's no straight lines. Um, shit just happens, and you just deal with it, and you got to make out of it, you know. What do you consider your first big break in your career? Career break? Well, again, by accident. So the Ziff family, Bill Ziff had gotten sick, which is extraordinarily unfortunate, because he is, I, honestly, there ought to be movies about him. He had a genius IQ and a photographic memory, and could not have been more generous and more kind, spoke any language. If he didn't speak it, he learned it yesterday and then, you know, could speak it um, and cared a great deal about people. When his kids took over, who have become extraordinarily successful investors, Zip Brothers, um, they were honest with their dad and said, we don't want to run this business. So they sold it. They sold it to uh, a traditional buyout firm called Forceman Little. And here we are, technology people, computer magazines, they spent $1.4 billion for the company. It's more than they've ever spent in a private equity deal. And the last company they bought before us was a candle company. So you can imagine how those conversations went. Fortunately, one year after that, less than a year after that, SoftBank bought it from them. And that's when everything started to gain momentum. So the first big break I got was when the Ziff family moved out, they made me publisher of the number one magazine in the company. I literally started at the bottom and ended up as the CEO of that company. So that story can actually happen. And that allowed me, and, and so the Forcemans wanted us to invest in the company, but I didn't have any capital to invest. And I had a great boss who I'm still close friends with today, a mentor, Eric Hippo, if you ever need seed money on the East Coast, he's your guy, uh, Lara Hippo, uh, Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, all those great companies. And he figured out a way to get, lend my wife and I the money to be able to buy equity, and that changed our life because that allowed us to pay off our mortgage and have money for our kids' education, and that was at 35 years old. That was the first time I understood what equity was. Okay. So you, you've, you've gone through and seen a lot of industries. You went through the publishing industry. You helped grow Yahoo to its height of its enterprise value, you know, do some of its most important deals. It, it feels like we're at a time to me now where we're in a shift, right? The, the mobile phone had its 10-year run we're at the cusp of AI and VR and you know, self-driving cars, but they're not quite here yet. As you take a step back and you look over the technology landscape, what are you interested in? Because for example, like you, you've done a bit of investing yourself, right? Yes. How many companies have you invested in? Probably 20, 20 to 25. So what categories and sectors are most interesting to you? Well, I, when I invested seed because I'm not a founder, and even when I sold ZDNet for a billion six, we had just gotten equity 12 months before we sold the company, so we really didn't, and I sold it to CNET, I never sold a share, and the stock dropped down to 67 cents, so I barely made any money out of that. So it's not like I could have written huge checks. But what I look for is the person, and a good friend of mine who, one of his partners is in the room tonight, you know, Kelly is over there. If you ever want to raise money, talk to Kelly. Um, you know, they will tell you that the number one thing you look for is grit. Because shit's going to hit the fan. 
There's nothing you can do about it. You could have done everything right and it's still gonna go wrong. And so who do you wanna be in the boat with when it flips over? So you pick the person and the space and the passion. If those three things exist, I'm very happy to write a check of a size that, that I can write. Um, and I've been fortunate. So that became Airbnb and Square and Uber and um, because I saw people that were the kind of crazy I was talking about earlier. So let's, talk, let's talk about some of those deals. There were a lot of people that saw uh, Airbnb early on. Mm -hmm. it, 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 from what I remember, it did the rounds as far as its Series A. A lot of investors got to see it. You didn't think at a time of terrorism having strangers <laughs> stay in your home was a good idea? <laughs> What, what was it that you saw in that business that other people missed? Have any of you, I know Kelly, you have anybody here met Brian Chesky? Once you meet Brian Chesky, Joe Gebbia, you don't need to know anything else. They just, most of the great ideas that I've been around, remember, I've never had an original idea myself, so listen to her as much as you're little, but I've been around these amazing people, Bill Ziff and Massa and... Um, uh, you know, Chesky and Zuckerberg and Sandberg and, and Dave Goldberg, who spoke of this. You know, these are all friends that have that I've gotten the opportunity to know and watch what they do. They're solving their own problem. And when you meet somebody who's solving their own problem, and it turns out lots of people have that problem. The founders of BlackBerry, do anybody remember BlackBerry? This is before the iPhone. I was one of the first people to ever have one, and I was speaking to Jim Basile about it. And I was, when I was retiring from Yahoo, he called me up to congratulate me because we put the first consumer apps on the BlackBerry at the time before the iPhone had come out, right? You were going against the good and the danger and, and those things. And he said, the first, it took five years to get to 900,000 subscribers of BlackBerry, and the next nine months, they got five million. And all they were ever trying to do was solve their own communications problems. So Brian and Joe, they were like, we got no money. People are going to have to stay with each other. It's a better experience anyway. It keeps the hotels from jacking things up. They're not doing any new construction. Why wouldn't this work? And, you know, it's a different generation. Same with Rent the Runway. Anybody rent a dress from Rent the Runway? My wife was absolutely certain I'm an investor and, and on the board and think Jen is extraordinary. And um, she's one of those kinds of people. And, you know, my wife's like, no one's ever going to wear a dress that, they don't even want to wear a dress that someone else could buy at a store, let alone one that they actually wore and rented. And they got 5 million members, mm -hmm. right? So I stopped questioning the idea and invested in the passion and the person. And I look at, I look at you know, hotels and travel. It's one of the biggest spaces in the world. You look at fashion, women's fashion in particular. It's the biggest e-commerce space in the world. So if there's somebody crazy enough to go after it, I love them. So it, it feels to me a lot like you're in the business of people. Well, when I invest my money, I'm in the business yeah. of people. But even, even what you do today in recruiting great people and managing them, I think one of the things that I've been really fascinated with, with for a lot of years now was a, a big reason why we started Comparably is this idea of what makes a great company culture. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's hard with a team of four people to get it right and communicate the right way and not piss everybody off every single day where you want to kill each other and you're barely hanging on by a string. How many employees do you have now at Chegg? When we started, we have 50, and now we have 750. Okay. So, so talk about that a little bit. I mean, I know it's maybe not the exact God, experience. Worse. When I got there, there were 3,000. We fired 800. And when I left, there were 14,000. That one... But, but Chegg, you are the head of, you, 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 you help scale that company. What are the keys to making that run like a well-oiled machine? What processes do you have in place? And what are the characteristics you look for most in people? Not just entrepreneurs, which a lot of the folks in the room are, but when you're hiring somebody at a mid-level, a VP level, what are the traits that you have to see in that person that you know that they're going to be the right addition for your team? By the time anybody gets to me, we already know they have the skills. Right, so that's, that doesn't seem like that big of a thing anymore. There's enough people in tech now that have had these skills. There's enough people that understand SEO. There's enough people that understand apps. There's enough people that can be developers. Back in, back in the day, there weren't. So you found people and culture was not important. You just took the people who could do that work and you paid them as much as it took to get them. And it went for as long as it could before it blew up. And that's generally what happened. In this generation, 
it's really about chemistry, what, what I call with my team communication chemistry, which is if you can't build a relationship of trust, how many of you are pissed because somebody who works for you isn't doing it the way you would do it? Okay, how many of you are lying? Everybody put up <laughs> your hand. Because you're all freaks. You're all power freaks, right? You're all control freaks. And so one of the things you have to learn, I had to learn, was I don't, as long as they're doing it within the rails of, you know, what's legal, what's ethical, what's moral, um, might as well play to their strengths about how they get it done. So I stopped worrying about, I stopped, prescribing success and started describing it. So I had to become a much better story. That's a great teller. line. Did you just invent that or did you steal that from somebody? That's very tweetable. You stop prescribing success and you start describing it. Right. And so... Uh, did you get that from anybody or just make that up? Well, I have a problem because I said earlier I've never had an original idea, but it's possible <laughs> that one actually is an original idea. So I don't know. Can we please tweet that out and give him at credit right now so if someone else takes that, we can trade any, market any, for you tonight? Any college kids here or recently college kids that use EasyBib? So we own EasyBib, so I can run it through there to see if I'm plagiarizing it. Cool. Um, no, but what it became, it's about storytelling. It's about communication. It's about authenticity. And it's about chemistry. And honest to God, it's about attitude. Every great performer who has a shitty attitude blows up and blows you up at some point. You can look at sports teams, you can look at bands, you can look at anything where there's a group. And so can, you, can you help me understand? Let's forget everybody here. Can you help me? Why is it that that's not more self-evident to folks? And as a leader, if you find that's not the case with one of your team members, do you, do you try to make that better or do you just say, hey, let's part ways? Because for me in my life, I feel like that is such a self-evident truth that if you can stay positive in the face of conflict, you become so valuable to whatever environment you're in professionally, yet not a lot of people have that characteristic in spades. So everybody comes to the game with different strengths. There was a great article 10, 12 years ago in the New York Times corner office section. New York Times, a print thing. You might have seen it. It's full of fake news. Um, but... It was interesting because somebody, the, the question was asked to the CEO was, you have the happiest employees we've ever seen. How is it? He goes, well, I fire all the unhappy ones. <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty good thinking. <laughs> so you think of two things, which is how do you invest in those that are contributing, have a desire to contribute, are willing to do what it takes, have a good attitude, bring others along, and how courageous are you to get rid of a short-term performer and I think it just comes with experience. And the challenge for most first-time founders is you haven't run anything. You haven't managed anything. So you got a company, you got funding, you got investors, you got a potential board. You don't even have a board, you have board members. And then you have employees, and then you're dependent on that employee because who wants to come to a startup or the CEO they never heard of? There are choices you make along the way. When you get to be my age, it's really more obvious that things work well when the team communicates better, trusts each other, and believes in each other, even if they're going to have a spat. And I've been fortunate, which is, is a rarity in Silicon Valley. Remember, I priced at $12.50. First trade was $11.25. I think we're trading at about $8.50 now. So we were as low as $3.15 a year ago. So, um, and the market cap of the company? Is about $800 million right now. Um, but... Is that ever frustrating well, you? Just, by the let me just finish this, this point before you get to the things that piss me off. Um, <laughs> which is my entire management team, my entire C level team, has stayed with me all seven years. And the one that hasn't stayed with me seven years, only because I hired him five years ago. And so. And what's the secret to that? I love them. I care about them. They care about me. They love our mission. And we've come to this agreement that nobody's perfect, but together we have a better chance to succeed against the mission we care about than not. And that, yeah, that person may not get it always right, but that person is always showing up, always got your back, always willing to try, and we rip the Band-Aid off. We just, we sit, the end of every year, um, you can appreciate this, on Yom Kippur I say to the team, you know, I apologize for anything I knowingly or unknowingly did, Tell me what I should do less of. Tell me what I should do more of. Tell me where I suck so we can get better. And they do the same for me. And, and tell it to me in Hebrew. No. 
I married a beautiful Lutheran, so I'm not going there. Um, but I'm just, so I just, I had reached the point where I realized no one's hiring me for my intellect. No one's hiring me for my coding skills. So what I got to do is be, figure out how to be both a manager and a leader. Let's talk, let's talk about hiring for a second. How many folks here in the last five years have hired anybody? All right, and how many of you have to hire somebody in the next six months? All right. I he really wants to know how many are going to use his site. <laughs> no, that, uh, but I appreciate the plug. <laughs> I, the single biggest thing that I thought I was going to be good at when I started my first tech company that I was awful at was hiring. And to this day, you know, 12 years later, I still really struggle with, hey, how do you just, without getting some warm referral, right, what really is the best way to know if this person sitting across from you in this artificial environment of having a conversation that doesn't replicate what it's going to be like when you actually have to be in the trenches working together is going to be the right fit for the company. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are trying to get better at hiring and knowing when somebody's the right fit, what kind of standards we should have. How, how have you changed over the years and what secrets, what advice, what wisdom do you have for how all of us can hire better? I think there, I think you have to figure out for yourself who you work best with. Most of you are startups is what I saw. So most of you don't have 25 or more employees. So it's the relationship between the first 10 that's going to make or break your company. And I have a bunch of isms. One of them is don't borrow a problem from tomorrow or today. Meaning, don't worry about whether this person is going to be right for when you're 50 people, because the first trick is to get to a position where you can get 10 people. And then when you get to 50, you have to be able to reevaluate. And the truth is, like in your own life, like your own relationships, like your own friendships, companies go through periods. They go through birth, they go through the awkward teenage years, they go through, you know, the 20s where you realize, holy shit, this is my life. Um, and then... <laughs> You get to be my age, you're like, what a great life. And, and so you need different people for different stages. And I think the difficulty is we try to find the person that we think can span all the stages. And in the tech world in particular, it just doesn't happen that way. There's very few people that will scale from this size company to that size company, particularly in the leadership positions. And so I would say that there are things that we worry about that we shouldn't worry about. It's really about can this person get this job done and be a contributor from an attitude perspective. And if those two things are true, then people are going to root for their, their success. Their peers are going to root for their success. Everything else is just overthinking it at, at the very first beginning. of. Do you, have a, do you have a set of go-to questions? What two or three questions when you're in that final interview with someone that your team already says, hey, you know that skill set, how do you assess someone really quickly? So again, I, when it gets to me, the skills are pretty much defined. The question that I love to ask is the one I always ask last, which is for you to achieve what you want to achieve at Chegg, how do you need me to manage you? And that is the most revealing question because it gives them an opportunity to dictate the terms in which they would come. It gives me the opportunity to understand, do I actually have the ability to get that person what they need for, to get what we need from them? And that's been the most revealing question for me because oftentimes that has been the way I've ended up managing people. And if it's veered from that, we've been able to always go back to that conversation and said, you know, do you remember when we sat down and I asked you and you said, whatever you do, don't do this. So I haven't done this. But now you're saying maybe you'd like some of this. Are we changing the terms in which we want to work together? Because I want to work in the environment that you can be successful in. And so that has been extraordinarily helpful for me. You, you know, in just the brief time we get in hanging out, and you've alluded to it here, like, because of both the breadth of time that you've been in tech and also what you've accomplished, it seems like you know everybody. Everyone that's a rock star in tech, from any famous CEO to somebody. I don't know everybody, but I'm going to meet all of you tonight. <laughs> yeah. Who are the, the you know, Elon Musk, Sheryl Sandberg, you know, all these folks. Who, who of the who's who is really the most impressive to you? And who have you either learned the most from or just you feel like they really have the goods? And, and what's that, what is that quality that they have? I would say that rather than drop a name, 
which I think I'd feel uncomfortable with. Um, all of those people, plus people you've never heard of, they have a common thing, which is they have grit, they have love, they have passion, and they would rather win as a team than win individually. And I have been shocked. Most of the people that I know that are quote unquote famous weren't famous when I met them. So they've grown into really cool jobs. I mean, when I met One Cheryl, name, give one name, come on. One name? Yeah, one non-famous person who's famous. I love Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kelly's the kind of person I think is amazing, which is she's now a partner at a venture firm having started out as an assistant, but figured out the industry, did everything it took to, to work it, met everybody, solved people's problems. I mean, I think that's the kind of people that, that change people's lives. But, you know, I, uh, one of your speakers, because he can't, unfortunately, can't talk back, which is Dave Goldberg, who's somebody that spoke here a couple of years ago. Dave, Dave was one of the greatest founders there was, one of the most generous people, one of the nicest people. Um, loved my kids. My kids loved him. We'd go to every Springsteen concert we could go to. And, you know, Dave was a billionaire sitting in the back, the tr latch, the hatch of our car, taking all of our kids to go see Springsteen, quizzing them on the songs. So it's really people that care about that kind of stuff that have always, that I aspire to be. Um, you know, Dave was the kind of guy where it's, you got a problem, call Dave. You having a good day, call Dave. Need to network with somebody, call Dave. It just was call Dave. And I aspire to be that person. But, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate to know a lot of people, but I think it would be wrong to just yeah. bring out their names. You, I want to talk about the personal journey for a little bit. Um, there's an article I wrote a bunch of years ago called The Unintended Consequences of Startups. And uh, I think a lot of what I talk to fellow founders about is how it's a lonely journey, right? And I think anybody that's trying to accomplish something big in life is both going to get people upset at them at times, but also is going to make a lot of self-sacrifices. You worked like a crazy person, mm -hmm. 14, 15, 16 hours a day probably through your 20s and 30s and even beyond that. Through there, 45. Yeah. There were a lot of personal consequences. What was, what was it like for you to make the personal sacrifices that you did and being on a, maybe a little bit on the other side of it now, what advice would you have for everybody that's maybe making those sacrifices right now? So if we were all being honest, how many of you work, feels like you work around the clock? Most of you. And... Of those of you who are doing it, you don't think you're sacrificing. You may bitch about it from time to time, but it's 100% your choice. So what I didn't understand was the impact on the people in my life that actually were making the sacrifices. It wasn't a sacrifice for me to work 19 hours a day. I didn't know what else to do, right? You try getting 900 emails a day, you know, when you're the CEO of Yahoo in a job that's way over your head in a highly competitive market and think that it's okay to sleep. But but that's all I knew how to do. So I didn't think I was sacrificing. I thought I wasn't succeeding. But it's my daughters, my wife, my dog. You know, it's, it's my friends, my friendships, health. It, it turns out there's a, there's a consequence of not trying to figure out how to surround yourself with people that are better than you at the things that they do and focus your attention where you can get the greatest leverage. And too often we use the excuse I got to do everything. Well, no one gets leverage if you do everything. So, you know, this again is a great Brian Chesky quote. When, when Brian, when they were first starting Airbnb, we'd talk occasionally on Saturdays, and he would just keep asking the question, where do I get the greatest leverage as a CEO? And it turned out what we do and where we get the leverage and where we need the leverage, if those three things are not aligned, we're not in harmony. And so I've become much better at focusing my attention on the place that I can have the greatest impact, that will have the greatest impact on the most number of people, and not try to do 20 things. Well, I have almost no impact, but I'll, go, I'll be the hero and martyr. And how do you usually identify what's gonna give you the biggest impact? I think about that a lot. What do I need to do today, this week, that's gonna make the biggest difference? Is that always clear to you? Well, it's always clear to me at the end of the discussion. It's, it's rarely clear right up front. Um, but I ask three questions, and my team can get a yes or no in 15 minutes by just answering three questions, which is, what is the problem you're solving for? If you can't define what you're solving for or the opportunity you're going after, we shouldn't be having the conversation. 
The second one is the bigger one. The second one is the one that becomes actionable for me as a CEO. Can they define success? So if that happens, what gets better for our company? And if they can't define that numerically, then they can't answer the third question, which is the one that gets funded or gets the time, which is, is it big enough to matter? Too often, people don't, they, they think they gotta do something and no one's ever asked them, so what would it look like if you succeed? And do you even know what it would look like to succeed? My, my favorite story of this, and I will give no names, but this was right before I left Yahoo, I had, a, I had the front page team come in and say, Dan, we gotta change the logo to purple. <laughs> like, of course you do, that's our problem. And I said, why? They said, we're losing the youth. I said, wow. Um, how many, how are we defining youth? How many did we have two years ago? How many do we have now? Uh, how many do we have a year ago and how many do we have now? And they're like, I don't know. So how do you know we're losing the, the youth? Well, because look how good Google and Facebook are doing. It's like, I get that they're doing good, but I don't think purple's the reason. <laughs> so they couldn't define the problem they couldn't define success, and so I opted not to do it. And of course, I quit, and six months later, they went ahead and made it purple, and you see how well it's gone since then. <laughs> um, so now they're oath, um, if you read that article today. So I, I, I think those three things make it super easy to make a fast decision, because a good friend of mine is one name I will drop, John Donahoe, who's now the CEO of ServiceNow, was a chairman of Bain, and was the CEO of eBay and PayPal and Skype, and did that whole split, and probably one of the most brilliant, successful, humans and an amazing CEO, um, you know, he, he always made sure that whatever you did had a purpose, that it was mm -hmm. clearly communicated, um, and that he taught me that every decision that everybody in this room is going to have to make is 51-49 by its nature. If it had any better odds, somebody else would have made it. So the CEO, the founder, makes the 5149 calls, which means it has just as likelihood of being a failure as it does a success. And so how much time can you spend trying to figure out the difference between 5149? Pick a direction, give it everything you have, and if it stops working, shoot it, move on to the next one. So I think that was great advice that I got. Let's rewind to 2005 when you were still at Yahoo, okay? Your name CEO of Yahoo at that point. Is it, what could you have done? No, no, I'm saying let's, we're going to replay history. Oh. Okay, you're, you're named CEO of Yahoo. What, what should or could have that business have done to reinvent itself so that it wasn't the place that used to be the homepage for the internet and now is going to be... So I'm going to drive you crazy with my answer because you're not going to like it, which is one of my isms is you never know the road not taken, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. It's, it's, whatever I say now will make me sound brilliant because I actually know what happened. Um, I did not want to be the CEO of Yahoo at the time. Plenty of discussions about it. I opted out of it for a lot of personal reasons and professional reasons. Why did you opt out? It was, like, isn't, wouldn't I, it that just, be the pinnacle at that time, the most well-known internet brand of its day? Why wouldn't you want to be the number one at that company? I was the number two person, and the role of the number two person is to be in line with the number one person and show no sunlight between the number one and the number two. So to have no opinion outside that room, but to execute. And um, after five years, turning the company around, doing the things that I do well, there was just no more joy in it for me. Um, I can give you specific examples, but they, they don't really matter. At the end of the day, um, I think you should do whatever you do until you're not happy doing it and do something else. And uh, I wish I had learned that earlier. But the first four years there were the greatest times of my life because it was a lot like the, movie, the, the show Jersey Boys. Anybody see Jersey Boys? So I'll spoil it for all of you. Um, at the end, they asked Frankie Valli, the character playing Frankie Valli, what is it you love the most? And he says, was it the music? Was it the fame? Was it the 100 million records? Was it the money? Was it the women? He said it was none of those things. It was four guys sitting in a room, hadn't done anything yet, dreaming about what was possible. And that felt like it had left at that point. And, and so it just wasn't the right environment. But you me. still feel like after all these years you had that at Chegg? What's, why, why did year four That's at Yahoo for feel me. different than year seven at Chegg? So here's the weird part. I had never been in a job, I'd been at Ziff Davis 15 years, but I'd never been in a job 
more than three and a half years. Even when I was the CEO of ZDNet, I sold the company right at this three and a half year mark. And Yahoo was the longest I had ever been in the same job. And it turned out to be five years, but after four years, I hated it. So I was like, maybe I'm just not good after three and a half years. Maybe this is a Dan thing. And so when that time came around at Chegg, I was like, well, it's time to go. And then I was like, but I haven't done anything yet. We haven't finished it yet. I love my team. I love our mission. I think we can actually pull this off. Why do I have to do something different? And that was a big change. And, you know, some people in this room I talk to about that. And because I'm like, what do you do if you're actually happy, think you have more to do, don't think you've nailed it yet? Um, and they're like, do what you want to do until you're not happy doing it. And that was a big turnaround. And, you know, I started behaving badly as a CEO, which is if you, if you ever don't commit, you're guaranteeing failure. So has anybody heard of the, of the great Bill Campbell? You got panty? You have. So, so you would know how awesome he is. So Bill is famous for almost everything. Um, eventually became a billionaire, but started out as a football coach at Columbia, then went to Boston College. Then his wife said, you know, get a job that earns money. So he went to work for something called Kodak. I don't know if any of you remember Kodak. Uh, in upstate New York, in Rochester, New York. And that introduced him to a guy who ran sales and marketing for Pepsi, a guy named John Scully. Scully then moved to Apple, hired Bill to come out to the West Coast. See how all serendipity works? No straight lines? Well, Scully gets fired, and who's the only one job keeps around is Bill Campbell. Bill ends up becoming Steve's best friend, his mentor, joins the board, spins out Claris, then becomes the CEO of Intuit. And so he mentors, he mentored Jobs and Larry Page and you know, every Bezos and all those amazing people. And I was very fortunate that he was willing to mentor me. And, and I basically met him through my daughters from the same high school where he was the big benefactor of the high school. And sadly, he died of cancer, but he was a football coach in his nature. He happened to become a billionaire, most generous guy in the world. And he would come in once a month for three hours. And the rules were he doesn't take money, doesn't take cash, doesn't take shit. And he can meet with anybody about anything, with or without me, and he doesn't care about the company, he cares about me. And that's the only thing you need to look at a mentor. Somebody's gonna focus on you, because any other agenda isn't, coaches can be about the company, mentors have to be about you. And I'd never really experienced that kind of love in my life, and he was absolutely remarkable and amazing. But there was a time when I was thinking of quitting, because I was in that stage, and I'm like, ah, oh, are we ever gonna get through this thing? Are we ever gonna get the stock price up? Are we ever gonna get this? Are we ever gonna get that? And somehow or another, he sensed it, even though he had been home with cancer for months. And he called me up. My assistant said, Dan, Bill's on the phone. And I went running upstairs, because when Bill calls, you go running upstairs. And Bill's a Bud Light, Pittsburgh. He couldn't string together three words without the F word being two of the three. I mean, just the most generous human being in the world. You had to see who was at his funeral. It was I don't think anybody should aspire to die, but you should aspire to have that level of impact on people's life. And he called me up. He said, Dan, he said, we should take a walk. I was like, oh, my God, you're feeling well enough to take a walk. I'll be at your house in 20 minutes. He said, no, 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 no. We're going to take a walk on the phone. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to go out behind the woodshed. I was like, the woodshed? Do I take my pants off or leave them on? <laughs> and he said, leave them on, but you're going to feel it. And he said, Leaders lead, leaders don't quit, leaders don't question their commitment, and both feet need to be firmly in, but don't ever call yourself a leader. And he hung up the phone. And from that day forward, I have not looked back. I don't know how he knew, I don't know why he knew, but son of a gun, if he just didn't know, if he didn't pick up on it. And from that day, I've been 100% committed, and. I don't think it's a coincidence the company is on an extraordinary roll right now. It's really beautiful. It's weird to be in a world where everybody, I mean, he's so present everywhere. It's amazing. The, the quad at our company, he saved the company, in my opinion. The quad at our company is named the Bill Campbell Quad now. And, and um, I, I hope you aspire to find somebody like that in your life because found it very late in my life, but what a difference it made, and it's still making today. My daughters loved him, my wife loves him, and 
most generous human being. So talk about where Chag's going. It's five years out. I'm curious to know where you want, what's the big vision for Chag? It started as a business that was reselling college textbooks, right? This Renting isn't them. the big grandiose ID that VCs are like, oh, it's going to change the world. I don't know how many people have tried to get a business like that venture f back since then. It's been really difficult. Try to get a business that requires a lot of cash that is about something called print. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. So that, and then also I'm just really, I mean, it must be frustrating to see companies in the private realm that aren't even doing $50 million in revenue, l losing $100 million a year with a billion dollar valuation, while you guys are slugging out a real genuine EBITDA business and have to fight for that valuation. I, I want to know where you want to take that business and what it's been like for you as a CEO of a public tech company that doesn't get any of the benefit of the shine that all these private tech companies. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you to keep thinking. Is there anything else you want to, you yeah. want to talk about? Death? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, and, and no one's going to hold you to prediction. This guy kicks puppies. <laughs> but what's going to happen with this tech market? We'll come back to that. But I, I, I want to end there, right? And, and so okay. let's go to the first two. Where, so do, where do you want to take Chegg in the next so, five so years? Does anybody, can, can I take two minutes to explain the college market? Because this is the future of the United States of America, and I think you got to get it because, holy shit, did I not get it. So there are 20 million people in college. 70% of them go to a state school. So 30% of them are the ones that go to all the schools we aspire to hire people from for God knows whatever reason. Of the 70% that go to state school, almost 50% of them will not graduate. The average length of time it takes to graduate, if you graduate, is six years not four years. The average student's graduating with $34,000 in debt. In the last nine months, 40% of the people with college debt have paid nothing on it and cannot declare bankruptcy on it legally because the United States government is siphoning out their money to pay off the debt. They're the only thing you cannot declare bankruptcy on. So you've got 50% of them not, gra oh, here's the other statistic. 40% of them work more than 30 hours a week while they're in school. How many folks here are still carrying college debt? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a real thing in getting worth. It's, it's $1.3 trillion in debt. So everything we do is about saving the students time, saving them money, and getting them smarter about a lot of things. So one of the things I learned from Google when they came up with this thing of just organize the world's information, nobody knew how much information there was to organize. So for me, if I can just stick with the mission, saving time, saving money, and getting smarter, what, what college kid wouldn't want that? What we can do under that umbrella has changed dramatically. So whereas we went public, 80% of our revenue was print textbook rental, now it's 25% of the revenue. And it's break-even business, and it's over here, and everything is about getting you into the right college, getting you uh, self-help, homework help, getting you online, the biggest marketplace of online, real-time tutors. It's like Uber for tutors. If you can't say Uber anymore because you're pissed off, then it's Lyft for tutors. Um, <laughs> And, um, and you've done a lot of acquisitions. Well, yeah, these all became acquisitions. So we took our asset and, and reformed it. And now we have the largest writing product. So we're going to go bibliographies and citations. 400 million new ones were done through our service last year. 1.4 billion are already in it. 30 million students use it. And the next step is we own internships.com and we're building the largest career site. Essentially, what we're going to do you is... You bought two LA companies now, by the way. You bought Cramster and you bought internships. You'd figure I'd have more hair. <laughs> um, so... So by the way, if you're starting a company in the college space, this is your future or acquirer right here. Yeah, that's why I can't, I can't buy my checkbook. <laughs> um, so imagine a scenario where we help students pick the right college, the right major, get a better grade, learn the subject matter better, align themselves with the amount of money that they borrow to the kind of job that they will pay them back. They can actually get an ROI. So we're going to be able to know if you go to this school and take this major, you're likely to end up doing this job at these companies, and this is what you're likely to get paid, and this is when you're going to be able to pay back your college loan. We have, we have over 30 data scientists now who are focused on using all of this information, because every one of our customers, we know your high school, we know your college, we know your class, we know your major, because it's all digital now. We know when you're doing your work, we know when you're stuck, we know when you use a tutor, we know when you do self-help, we know when you watch a video. Uh, we know which kind of skills So you're, that you're really going to be in the business of transitioning people from education into their career. We think it's our birthright to help you get, pick the right school, spend the right amount of money for it, take the right major, get an internship, and get your first job. 
and that puts us in the category of being one of the most valuable companies in the world. And so you asked me about my frustration. For a lot of years, it was embarrassing. Look, you live in Silicon Valley, and everybody's a billionaire, and you're not. Everybody's a founder, and you're not. Everybody's a venture capital, and you're not. Everybody goes public, and at least has that one moment where the stock goes up, and you didn't. <laughs> and you had to do it in front of your wife and your two daughters who bought in at 1250. You're like, hey, Dad, what's up with that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had moments of sucking my thumb in a bed. And thank God I have one of the most extraordinary wives in the world. She's like, mm, get your ass out of bed because you've got 700 people depending on you and, you know, 5 million college kids, you know, get back to work. So that's my story. All right, my last question for now, and everybody get ready. I am going to ask for your prediction. So you said you don't want to revisit the past, but that means I'm going to hold you to predicting the future. We do have this video, so if you're wrong, I'm going to edit it out. If it's right, you're going to look like a hero. You've seen a lot of cycles now. You were there the first dot-com bust. You were there in 2009. I was there before there was a dot-com. I was there when there was a hardware bust. I was there when we went from mainframes to minis to desktops, to notebooks, to everything through mail order, to IBM almost going out of business, becoming a service company, to all of a sudden a proliferation of software, to all of a sudden Microsoft eating all the software. And in 1996, I thought the whole thing was over, and then along came the internet. And so I've seen every one of those cycles. So where are we now? It's 2017. You know, there have been some bumps the last two years. It's, there's an incessant talk about, you know, are we in a bubble? When is this going to end? People, I think, are waiting for what's going to happen at a macro level with the economy, but valuations are at an all-time high. There's still a ton of money, where, whereas you have companies today that are making revenue, they're growing perhaps unsustainably, unprofitably. They have massive valuations in the private sector. You have companies raising more money in the private sector than you ever could have imagined. 30 years of perspective, what's your take on where we're at right now, what's gonna happen in the next three years? We've seen this movie time and time and time again. So what ends up happening is it's a pendulum. There is too much money available for there not to be consistent funding from too many sources. The issue has really gone the other way, which is where's the liquidity? Because fewer companies are going public. And, you know, second market and those things did not turn out to be um, what people thought there would be because of regulation and how many investors you can have before you have to disclose and these things. But honestly, you've heard this before, what's different is the majority of the companies that will go out of business, that's not really a change. Nine out of 10 venture-backed companies go out of business. So I don't know that there's been that big a change. I think what's going on now is figuring out the right sector to fund. So some of the sectors that were hot have lost their hotness. Now, it, it, you know, and who knows what's going to happen with augmented reality and virtual reality. It's, you know, I, I was at a great conference where you had the Facebook guy talking, he was genius, um, and Magic Leap, and, they, and it's just sort of like, yeah, it's going to be amazing, but it's like 10 years from now. So, do, you think that there's any, do you think that there's any chance, and I'm going to take this slightly, slightly political just for one second, that the rules that we've played by in terms of business maybe for the last 40, 50, longer might actually be changing. So just for example, whether you're, you know, someone's pro or against, and we probably know what most people in this room are, for the president, most people said, hey, someone like that could never win. And literally 100, 200 years of you know, standard predictable expectations for what you know, someone could win for the highest office in the land changed. Do you think we're at a time where you know, maybe from this point forward, it's a completely new playbook, and the rules that we've played by in terms of business for the last 50 to 100 years might be different going forward. It's a fabulous question, and not one that can be answered by a Hobart William Smith grad that didn't go to business school. <laughs> so what, what I would say is this. The, the, I have marveled at what I've seen created from early Hollywood to Silicon Valley, almost all of you are breaking some rule or some law or some norm. So let's remember, YouTube, I, I, I will never forget this way, Jeff Weiner is the CEO of LinkedIn, one of the most extraordinary <laughs> human beings, brilliant guy. I had the um, luxury of being his boss for five years, which meant that he was my boss for five years. He's that good. Um, 
Which company was that, Yahoo? This was at Yahoo, and Jeff is, was the CEO of LinkedIn and sold it for $26 billion. And he's, he's just, just remarkable in every conceivable way. But I remember this moment where we were sitting in a room at Yahoo, and we were all trying to figure out this new thing called video search. So Yahoo was launching video search, Google was launching video search, and if you remember, they looked identical. We were just doing search, except now it was video. Along comes this thing called YouTube. And YouTube broke every law on the planet, particularly for you LA people. And I remember they, they did a ripoff of Narnia from Saturday Night Live, and Jeff Weiner breaks into an executive meeting, and he says, hey, YouTube's got this thing out, it's going crazy viral, can we put it on Yahoo Video? And our boss, who was uh, 26 years, Warner, chairman of Warner, Terry Semmel, another brilliant man, unbelievable, everything. I mean, if I pick right on anything, it's my bosses have all been incredible. Um, but he said, no, we can't do it because it's illegal. And I'll never forget this. Wiener said, well, we just lost the video search business. And he walked out of the room. Wow. And true, like all the stuff Google indexed, half of it was not necessarily legal. It's, so I don't know that the tech world, the internet world, has ever really bothered with that. I mean, one of the, the lines in Silicon Valley versus Los Angeles 15 years ago was, in Silicon Valley, the last C-level executive you hire is the general counsel. In Hollywood, the first person you meet with is the lawyer. <laughs> and, and because one group was designed to stop something from eating into what they have, the other group was trying to create something that didn't want to be bothered by law. And so, you know, if you look at everything, Facebook started out, or Airbnb, like you look at all these, Uber, all these regulations, self-driving, not self-driving. Somebody has to continue to push regulation that was created. There's a difference between what's a law to protect a human being and what's a regulation that existed to protect a business, right? Most of the things that are, are hurting Airbnb in terms of regulation are designed to protect the hotel industry. Not all of them. Some of them are for very good reasons in neighborhoods and other things. So I don't know that, that I don't know that, Chaos and anarchy haven't existed in the tech world. Mm -hmm. I do. I believe that they have. And what the challenge is, when you start following the rules and you're competing with people who don't, how do you deal with that? So um, that's a very different scenario. Dan, you asked me on the walk over here who were my favorite guests that I had so far. And I can tell you I've got a new favorite, which is you. It is rare <laughs> to have somebody that is as introspective as loving, as caring, as thoughtful about their answers and making it about everybody here. I think we are all privileged for the fact that we got the time. Dan flew down from the Bay Area for just this event this evening. You took an entire day out of your life, honestly, from everybody here, most of all me. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. <laughs> really, thank you.